without a doubt that we are those who have the crimson stain of sin that has been washed whiter than snow. We are in Hebrews chapter 13. We are one more week away from concluding Hebrews, and we have come through as a quick recap here. We spent the majority of this book, because the book is structured this way, looking at how much better Jesus is than everything in the Old Covenant. Right? He, is, he is better than Mount Sinai. He is better than the Old Covenants, the Old Ways. He's better than the Old Priesthood, the Old Kings. He's better in each and every way. And then it turns the corner and it gives us all these exhortations. And that's exactly where we're going to be. It's all these very pastoral exhortations of saying, hey, because Jesus is this, he's better in every way. Here's how your life should look. <laughs> and, and, and we're going to look at love. And, and, and I want to do something to help illustrate this. <clears throat> I don't know how you talk about love in your house, but love in my house looks an awful lot like this. <laughs> yeah, for the people in the back. <coughs> love looks an awful lot like this. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not a no-brainer. I mean, you click it down, you click it on, and you're good to go. Right? And it says, I love you so much that I want to suck up all the gunk on the car. I love you so much that I don't want crumbs around our dining room table for you. And, and really, if we were stopped to think about it, it's like, well, yeah, you, you need love in a marriage, right? You need love in any relationship. And, and if you step back and you think about this for a second, right, in, in, in a secular society, and, and religion's going to say, well, all we just need to do is love people. And then, and then sometimes there's a, a false statement on the other side of that. Like, we need to love people and God sort them out. <laughs> well, if we're not helping get things sorted out here, we didn't really love them. And, and so here's the thing. I mean, just think about it. You're, the, the news, the most secular of media, you, you should love people, right? Now, you go to religion, you go to Hinduism, you should love people. You go to Buddhism, you should love people. You go to Islam, you should love people. And, and then you go to Judaism, which is so much of the contrast that we've been doing. Hebrews, Hebrews. There's a church, that's who this book is written to, of Jewish Christians. And they're sorting out what to do with all of the Old Testament. They're sorting out what to do with all of the things they've kept and kept well. And so for the author here in Hebrews to step up and say, you need to love each other in the church. You need to love the people outside of the church. You need to love people. And here's how you ought to do that. That's not necessarily a new statement. Just as if I go to all the fellas in the room and say, love looks like a power force. Helix turtle. Now, that's not the idea of an anniversary present. No, love looks like you turning it on and using it. So you go over and you're like, hey, baby, love you. Love you. But that's, that's not how this machine works, right? This machine works the same way you ever have one of those IT calls and you say, hey, my computer's not working right. And they say, well, is it plugged in? Yes, I have an IQ at least the equivalent of a duck. Thanks. Right? Well, is it on? Okay, I have the IQ at least the equivalent of a goose. Here's, but here's the thing. The difference between what is being said in Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Judaism is this. It's, are you using this the right way. Because now the author has come up, and this is what we're going to see in this passage, is that we have a source that plugs us in to how to really love people. It's a source and it's a power. And listen, this doesn't work right unless it's plugged in. It will do nothing but probably make life worse. Friend, 
we try to live our lives unplugged from the source. Unplugged from the source. We go to, as we looked at last week, we go to Mount Sinai and we try to climb up Mount Sinai and say, God, look at me. And our Bible is telling us, look at Jesus. No, 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 no. Look at Jesus. There's a love there that you don't understand, that you're not tapped into, that you're not finding your source and your strength. And so Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 1, says this. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This is talking literally, right? It's talking about Abraham entertaining as he's being hospitable, entertaining these angels. In the book of Judges, three. Remember those who are in prison and those, and, and though in prison, as though in prison with them. And those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you see what it did there? It's taking this command to love, to love in this way, to love with hospitality, to love in going out to people in prison, to have love in our marriage, to be content and not love money, and then it's attaching it with Christ. It's attaching it with Christ. Right? Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what it's doing is it's saying, you need to love and find contentment, but you can only do it if you're connected with Jesus. And so it continues. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. Right? How do we love people with the help of the Lord? How do we live out these pastoral exhortations? With Jesus, not apart from him. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And it continues. In love, remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ, so here's what it's doing. It's talking about our imitation, our love, our obedience, and then it's a, we're seeing how it's attached with Jesus as our source and as our strength. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, for which you have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar, for which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So it's looking again at the old covenant, this going and having this lamb, this sacrifice that's given for the sin of the people, that it would be an atonement for them, and it's saying, listen, our altar isn't with a lamb, with goats, with bulls. Our altar isn't this either. Our altar is the cross. Because he's making this comparison between the bodies of the sacrifices and the body of Christ. And that's what we partake in. Again, this is our source. This is our strength. This is our identity. Right? That he has come on our behalf. Right? So Jesus also suffered, verse 12, outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his blood. Jesus paid it all. All to him I have. Sin had left a crimson stain, but his blood washed it white as snow. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. 
For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, with the exception of a few things in here, right, that we would welcome people, we would love people, that we would visit people, that we'd be content with what we have, that we'd be imitative, that we would speak and we would give. I mean, really, we, we look at this and go, well, what's the real difference between Judaism and Christianity? It's the sacrifice that makes the difference. It's the covenant that makes the difference. It's the grace and the strength that makes a difference. And so, this is how we approach all of this. Point one. <laughs> verse two. Right? Let, let, let brotherly love continue. Verse two. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Literally, this means to love outsiders. To love outsiders, the stranger, those who are not a part of us, those who are outside of your group, those who are different than you. <laughs> I want you to think for just a second about what Jesus did. Are you like Jesus? Right now, are, are you perfect in every way? Prophecy upon prophecy came to you. No, God, what did he do? He welcomes us as a stranger, but then he also does, carries out in verse 3, he visits us. Right? Jesus is our welcomer. Right? Do you realize that we were not a people, but now we've been made a people? We were not a nation, but now we've become the nation and the people of God. You've been welcomed into the family of God. Not based upon your blood, not based upon your sacrifice, not based upon your ability to ascend in Mount Sinai, but based upon Christ's work to come to us. And so we welcome the outsider and the stranger. Friends, this is the mark of what it means to actually, as we've looked through, if Jesus is truly better, and you have put faith in Jesus, then there should be evidence that backs up that you actually believe in Christ. Right? We're walking through those evidences. Do you love in such a way that you welcome those who are different than you? The outsiders, the strangers, the outcasts, the hurting, the broken, the different. This is what Jesus did on our behalf. He's our source of hope for this. And then our love visits. Verse 3. Remember those who are in prison. As though in prison, check this out. As though you're in prison with them. That they're, they're hurting and you're hurting with them. And this is specifically thinking about those who have left the midst of their church. They've been arrested for identifying with Christ. And now they're in prison. They're in prison for doing right. They're in prison for following God amongst all the other chaos and wrong rules that exist in their society. We visit them. We visit those. We, we visit those who are removed from the body. Right? We get mistreated with them. It says here. Listen, you think about anybody in, in, in this body who is just not here. Prison is, is real, but you know what? So is so real also is the ability to make it to church that is taken from us. I used to drive to church and it used to be easy, but now I need somebody to, to drive me there. Or I, I can't even make it. I just it's so hard for me to get outside the house. For any reason. The love that Christ has shown, the welcoming that Christ has shown, the visiting that he has given to us, what are we doing? We're exhibiting that same thing. 
for our, the church, for those that are here, for those that aren't here. Think again of what Jesus did for you. Remember those who are in prison as though we're with them, those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Oh, Jesus was mistreated on our behalf. And then some. And then this love, right? This, this love lived out in faith in Christ. It is faithful love. Verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Marriage. Specifically, right? To love broadly and deeply in this way. It should be what? It should be held in honor. Now, let me, let me just pause for a second because today in our society, marriage is either held in one of two ways. It's either held as everything or it's held as nothing at all. Right? Marriage is either everything you, you think of being a single, or, or maybe when you were, and you thought, man, if I, if I could just get married. Well, that, you see what that's doing? That's taking marriage and it's making it everything. Or you, you turn on the news and you see the way people treat marriage. You see the way people even talk about marriage inside of churches. And it's probably not everything, it's probably nothing. Listen, marriage is not the butt of our jokes. Right? If we view marriage the same way the media views marriage, the same way every other religion views marriage, then we've got it wrong. We've got it wrong. But that's what you see. You see it's either everything, right? I think it's kind of marriage season, whatever that means. Because there's all these expos, and there's, it's just it just kind of happens. I mean, listen, here's what somebody told me. You get engaged around Christmas because it covers your Christmas present, man. <laughs> and listen, I listened to that advice. It was good advice. Two for one, man. Yes. And then, and then so there's this commonality. You enter it, and here's what they're telling you. This is everything. This is the most important day of your life. This is this. This is this. Man, is it? Man, there is richness. There is blessing. There is wonderful thing. But if marriage is everything, that means Jesus is not. But yet, at the same time, marriage is God's idea. And so marriage is not nothing. Marriage is not to be trampled on. Marriage is not to be ignored. And it is not to be defiled. It's not to be defiled. It's God's idea. It's God's beauty. It's God's richness. And so what do we do? We honor it. We hold it with purity. Like specifically, you look at what this says, right? The, the marriage bed be undefiled. That means exactly what you think it means. And if you don't know what it means, hopefully you're too young. The marriage bed be undefiled. What is it? It's a picture of purity. It's the picture of faithfulness. We honor it. We honor it. We live this out. We don't ignore it. Right? When I say it's everything or nothing, here, here's the nothing stance. It's just a piece of paper. Oh, is it? And, and whose idea was marriage? Was it the judge of the courthouse? God's idea. And here's why this matters so much. Because it plugs us back into the source. Marriage is a picture of the gospel. The gospel is a picture of marriage. It's that God loves us with an everlasting, faithful love. Here's what we do. In our relationship with Christ, we muck it up. I, I muck it up. And Jesus constantly comes back to, because we're in this new covenant, he comes back to the vows that we made together. I'm keeping those. And so I step back, I'm reminded of my sin, and I go, God, thank you, God, for keeping this covenant. 
Thank you, God, that, as it says in Timothy, when I am faithless, he remains faithful. And so maybe you've been beat up. Maybe you've been hurt. Inside marriage, outside marriage, whatever. Here's the thing. You have a source that loves you regardless if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ. is that Jesus has been faithful, and he continues to be faithful. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. That we should be content. Why should we be content? How do we be content? Right? The world is telling us you need something else. You need the next thing. The turbo power flex force whatever. You need it. Right? There's, there's always something. And, and here's the thing. Our hearts we, our hearts are magnets, man. We are drawn to all the things that we just think we have to have. Do you know why social media exists? Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Uh, I'm sure there's something else. It's a magnet that's been created that says, look at what you need. Look at this. Look at that. You need this. And so here, here comes in and says, be content with what you have. And listen, specifically, this is talking about our freedom from the love of money. Actually, the word translated means the love of silver. In fact, that word, when it talks about the love of money or to not love money, hospitality, and to continue in brotherly love, they all share that same word of Philadelphia, of Philae. Right? Love. And then it describes the type of love, right? The love of brothers, the love of strangers, and then it talks about the love of money. This theme of love. So how, how, do we, how do we chase away and have a right contentment? Look at what it says. Be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Listen, if you have Jesus, what more do you actually need? Let me say that again. If you have a relationship with Christ, the faithful one, the welcoming one, the visiting one, the, the one who is love, and everything he does comes out of that place of love, if you have Christ, what more do you really need? This contentment is looking at the one who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is more than enough. He never leaves. This is the source and the strength of our contentment. And so when your heart gets pulled, it will be pulled. When it tugs in other directions, when your love gets misplaced, and you start to say things like this, maybe not out loud, but in your mind and in your heart, you say, God, you're just not enough. Now, you're not going to think those words, but your life is going to live that out. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden. God, what you've given me is not enough. But you have Christ who is more than enough and who never leaves you. And listen, never forsakes you. And it continues, this pastoral exhortation of love. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of your way of life and imitate their faith. Listen, the leaders in your life, who, who are the leaders in your life? Simply, those who speak the word of God. Those who speak the word of God. There are a measure, there's a measure and a model here I want you to not miss as we, as we go through this. Right? How, how do you measure a leader? Right? You hear the word of God from them. And you measure it by if you see the word of God in them. Do you, do you catch what I'm saying? Their words and actions match. But it is not just any words, it's the word of God lived out. 
It's their, as it says here, their way of life. Right? And so that's the measure. Do you hear the word of God from them? And do you see it lived out? Do those two things match? That's the measure. And from there, what do we do? We, we let that be our model for our life. We imitate their way of life. We imitate their faith. The measure and model. Where else do we see the measure and model? We see it in Christ. We see it in Christ. Again, we're tapping into the, the authors pointing us to Christ. What does he do? Right after talking about our leaders, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What did Jesus do? He came and spoke to you the word of God. He didn't just speak to you the word of God. He is the word of God in flesh. And so to say that the word of God and the way of God matched up in Jesus is an understatement. He's the word of God with that. He is the ultimate model for our life. And so, yet again, we have this source and this strength in Christ. And you contrast that with the leaders that they had had all throughout the rest of the Bible. Right? They, they got priests, and the priests just couldn't get things right. Their sacrifices, their way of life. They had judges, <laughs> which were a nightmare. They, their lives and their, their words never match. And so God, they said, God, we want a king. And things didn't get any better. Sometimes they would say the right things. Sometimes they would do the right things. Rarely did those two things match up. And so we, we kept getting pointed to a greater king, a greater priest, a greater prophet. And so when we come to, we come to the one who is the same yesterday, today, who never waves, who never changes, who is a constant for you. He is the measure of this leadership and the model. Then it continues. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Now, there are so many diverse and strange teachings we could touch on at this point. The, specifically, they're looking at, you could call it asceticism. Is that you need to put things into you that are going to make you better with Jesus, that are going to make you holier. Here's the thing. I, I've, I've been drawn to the book of Hebrews for a good point of my, my adult life. Simply because I, I, one of the reasons is I grew up Catholic. And it was, I, went to, I, I didn't just grow up Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy. I could tell you the funeral homes that paid better at Catholic funerals than other funeral homes. Right? I, I joked to somebody just the other day. I was like, they were like, oh, Eisenhower funeral home. They listen to the Oklahoma. I go, they were one of the good ones. And, and this, these strange teachings and these ideas that we can be strengthened with food. So we're going to come to the altar here in a second. We're going to come to these elements, and there is bread and there's juice. It's literally bread and juice. But there's a teaching that exists that when somebody prays over this, it becomes the literal body of Christ and the literal blood of Christ. It's, there's, a, there's a whole theological term. It's called transubstantiation. If you take your first Holy Communion as Catholic, you have to learn this. You have to get it right. I remember my first Holy Communion class, I was the only person that got that question right. But unfortunately, how wrong it was. How wrong it was. That's one of the reasons I've always been drawn to Hebrews. It's because in it, I see what Scripture says and how it goes against these vain religious attempts to get to God. Listen, it doesn't strengthen anyone. It's like trying to sweep and not be plugged in. Thinking that I can eat something and it's going to make me good with God. No. We should be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. 
right? Is that in Christ, what we're seeing is there is a substance that is greater than appearance, greater than man's approval. And in Christ, what we see is this mission of grace and truth. Grace and truth. So he gives us real truth. We, we see who he really is. We see what he has really done. And then what's happened is he offers all of it to us freely as a gift to be either received by faith or rejected by my efforts and my attempts. In Christ, we have grace and truth. Verse 10. Right, this is what we're, we're hanging this on. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. Right, those, those priests, the, the temple in the Old Testament, they have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood was brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So it's talking about this altar, it's talking about the bodies. So we interpret this by understanding the altar and the body associated with it. Right? They're looking at the bodies of animals. We're looking at a different body. Verse 12. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. This word sanctify means to make holy. That's what he's done for us. He's made us holy. And so this life Right? This life on faith in Christ, with real love, we lay down our lives. Right? And it's showing us, therefore, verse 13, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Jesus laid down his life. What's our response? To lay down my life. To lay aside my status. To lay aside my comforts. And to say, Jesus, wherever you go, that's where I want to go. However you lead, that's how I want my life to go. Our source and our strength is Jesus and the measure and the model that he's put before us. <laughs> Jesus is never asking us to do something he didn't already do. That's a huge difference between Christianity, true, real Christianity, Every other religion is out there. Every other religion is saying, you lay down your life for and Jesus comes and says, I laid down my life for you. Because you couldn't. You couldn't ever do it well enough. You couldn't be good enough. You couldn't be the perfect sacrifice that the only son of God so we lay aside ourselves, we lay aside our preferences, and we say, whatever it costs me, I'm with Jesus. And then this love also speaks. Verse, verse 14, and then it says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. That's how we can lay down our life. We know that there's something more than this life. Our hope is not in this place. 15. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. What's our sacrifice of praise? That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. We must speak. We must speak. Love, listen, love, your love, my love, must be spoken. It cannot be silent. Jesus should be on our lips. He must be on our lips, both inside the church and outside of the church. If Jesus is our everything, our source and strength of contentment, our source of life, our source of hope, he's been gifted to us, then don't you think we would talk about him? Like, a lot? Jesus, every once in a while somebody would say, you need to share the gospel and every once in a while use words. Nobody ever said that. I don't know. I don't know how that quote got associated with any 
old father of the church. Imagine this for a second. Jesus came. Imagine, if this is true, our love needs to have words. Imagine this. I just go around and I just go. It's like I'm a mind. Use some words, man. Well, well, thank you for vacuuming. Oh, I should love you. Imagine now for a second, Jesus comes. He lives this perfect life, and he never said a word. Zero, none. He goes around and he steals somebody. Doesn't say anything about it. Goes around and he heals the next guy. He goes in, takes five loaves, two fish, feeds thousands. Doesn't say anything. Do you see a problem there? We needed God to come in to this world and say, I am God in the flesh. Do it for you, which you can never do. And he, and he says, and I love you. Again, it's the words of God and the way of God, all in flesh in this person of Christ. Listen, our love has to have words. You don't believe me? You've already spoken and as you come into this place today, you've already spoken one time, three times, five times, ten times about all the things you love. And I'm not here to talk about about those things. No, we should talk about the things we love. Kids, grandkids. I've seen a couple of Jayhawk shirts today. Those are words. They express our love. There's a whole Bible that's helping us with this. But... We, we ignore it. We push it aside. That Jesus has come. Listen, he has spoken to you. In the, in the darkest days of your life, Jesus is speaking to you. In the brightest days of your life, Jesus is speaking to you. That there's been an offering, a fruit of lips that acknowledges his name. Jesus acknowledged his own name. Because his is the name that is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. That Jesus is Lord. We should speak him. Our source of strength with this is Jesus. It's Jesus. He spoke to us. And then, 16, we give. Do not neglect to do good, but share what you have. What do you have? I've got pears in my house. I'll share them with you. We should share. Share. Share what you have. Whatever it is that you have, you share it. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And so, let me, let me pause there for a second. Here in verse 16, it talks about sacrifices that are pleasing to God. If we were to go back to last week, chapter 12, verse 28... Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable or pleasing worship. Same words. Same idea. So it's all tied in right in the middle of this. How do we please God? How do we offer pleasing sacrifice to God? It's in love by His strength. And we give. We give. Listen, if we say we love someone and we're tight-fisted with them, we won't share, you know, do we really love? Like, you think of two kids sitting down at the lunch table? One kid opens his lunch. He's got a peanut butter sandwich and broccoli and an apple juice box because mom and dad, you know, they want to help. Next kid sits down across the table, sips open his lunch box, pulls out a healthy looking sandwich and a whole roll of oil right down on the table. Kid number one just drooling, watching them eat every little crumb, untwist every cookie and lick it, and then they polish them off and say, "Oh, I'm sorry. Did, do you want one?" I mean, we live our lives like this sometimes. We think only of ourselves. We're tight-fisted with whatever it is we've been given. Meanwhile. There's a world outside, even a church, that's wondering, am I really loved and cared for? 
It's Jesus, though. It's Jesus who gives. He gives everything. And so, we, do we agree with the song or not? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. You're never going to outgive Jesus. It may feel that way sometimes, but that's a lie. You're never going to outgive God. And so he is the source and strength of our giving as well, because this too is a right picture of love. Here's a, we're pleasing God by doing this, by imitating Jesus. Right? It says, such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We are pleasing God by imitating Jesus. We are letting our lives have a heavenward direction. The author intends for us to see how Jesus lived this out and is the source of our strength and our hope. This is what makes us different from everybody else. Is that Jesus came in and said, I, you can't. But I did. And so, me and you, let's walk this life, this way of life, the word of this life, in real grace, not some false asceticism that has the look of appearance of holiness, but nothing real. And so are you? Right? Are you pleasing God with your life? Giving God the sacrifices that are pleasing to Him. A pleasing worship, a greater love. This is evidence of those who have received the kingdom. This is an evidence of those who follow the King. Those who follow King Jesus have all these things coming behind them. That they welcome, they visit, they're faithful, they're content, they imitate, they're leaders. They have grace and truth. They lay down their lives, they speak love, and they give willingly. This is the evidence. It's that we are humbly lifting up Christ. And we're laying aside ourselves. This is our life together. This is our life together. Right? This is written in such a way to this Jewish Christian audience. If, if somebody would have walked in from the Jewish tradition and they would have walked into their church on a Sunday morning like this, they wouldn't be able to say, you're no different than me. And that's what this passage is instructing us. Is that in Christ, we are different. Not because we're so great, but because we're plugged in. We're plugged in. Is that when we hit a when we hit a stretch, or we hit a day, or we hit a morning, and we say, God, I just can't today. I'm at my last end. Or, Man, you, you don't know how hard my life is, God. And God just leans in with compassion and love and says, No, tell me about that. I, I, I want to hear more. And God reminds us with his words and with his way of life all that he has done to prove himself faithful and good and true and full of grace. And all the ways he has welcomed you and he continues to welcome you. And he continues to welcome those outside of our midst and inside our midst. And so the question this morning, your life, Is it pleasing to the Lord? Does it align with what we've looked at? That Jesus came, he took our place, and we've entered into a relationship with him. Does that, does that match? As we go through this, I mean, this is a list, let's be honest. This morning, it's just a list, like this, 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 this. And the list isn't there to go, hey, you know what? God wants to overwhelm you. You don't have enough going on in your life. Let's give you a 13-point sermon. No, it's, it's here to show us what the body of Christ looks like. Because the love of Christ has come to us. And we are those who claim 
we've received this love in faith and repentance. We pray with you. The musicians are going to come up there and lead us in a song of response. That's what this is. It's an opportunity to respond to the Lord. Listen, if you're here and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, there is nothing more important you can do. And so I'm, I'm going to be down front. There will be others here to help you. Do not hesitate on this. Don't waver on this. Is there something in your life you say, man, I, I'm just not right. I, there's this in my life. I've seen it this morning. It's not pleasing God. Will you go to the Lord about that? Jesus, thank you. God, we, we can't do this on our own. We need your strength. Not just Sundays, but every day. God, that this would be a place, your church, your little taste of heaven on earth, with an immeasurable love that flows inside and outside this place. And so, Jesus, let our words and our way of life match. God, we need you to do this. We can't do it on our own.